Sisters and brothers, welcome. Welcome to Sunday morning. Welcome to Ridgewood Park Church right here from the heart of Dallas, Texas. We are streaming worship right to you in your homes. My friends, we may be separated by a short distance, but we are united by God's Holy Spirit in our hearts. So we are worshiping together in these virtual, holy, and sacred moments. So my friends, let us just take a breath. Let us relax. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God together. Good morning and welcome to Ridgewood Park United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have gathered with us in worship today. We want you to keep in mind that many of our college students have returned back to their campuses and have begun classes this week. And our preschool, our Ridgewood Park preschool, is preparing to open their doors on September 8th. So continue to be in prayer for all of our students, both old and young. We want to invite you to stay connected through our Sunday school groups, through Pastor Bill's Bible study. We have daily devotionals and Facebook memories that are posted on Facebook each day. We hope that you are finding ways to stay connected with your church family. Now, let us continue as we worship together with our opening hymn. Please join us in the opening hymn, The Summons. We will sing verses one, two, four, and five.
Please join me in the call to worship. When I think of God's presence in the world, I am grateful. Grateful for the presence of hope, grateful for the gift of life. And when I think of God's presence in my life, I am humbled. Humbled by the gift of grace, humbled by the invitation to begin again. And when I think of God's presence in this community, I am glad. Glad to be with holy people worshiping our holy God. Thank you all. Thank you, God. Now please join with me in our affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, as we join our hearts in prayer, let us pray. Pray for the world around us. Pray for our community. Pray for our dear brothers and sisters who are suffering this day, from those that are sick, those that have lost their jobs, those who have experienced death in their families. Let us join together in these holy sacred moments and let us pray for one another. God of mercy, we confess that, like the disciples, we set our minds not on divine things but on human things. Doubting your loving care, we grab far more than we need. Doubting your loving purposes, we shrink from living as your followers. Doubting your loving plan, we become stumbling blocks in your creation. Forgive us, we pray that we may gain new life in you. O God of love, today help us to live peaceably with all. Help us live in genuine love, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to love you, O God, with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Holy God, as we sit in these moments of sacred worship, breathe your Holy Spirit within us. Speak to us in the silence. Reveal your presence in the fire of love that burns in our own spirits. Show us your holy path that we may move forward in confidence and courage. We, your beloved children, precious sons and daughters, God, we hope and we dream of a transformed world. We hope and we dream of your kingdom that is fully come. We hope and dream of you. Oh God, hear our hopes and dreams as we pray together the prayer Christ Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It's time for children's time. So I'm wearing my OU stuff. Three years ago, Grayson decided that he wanted to go to OU up in Oklahoma for college, and we bought in. We've got everything. We've got the t-shirts. We've got the hats. We've got the banners. There's things in our house that were too big for me to bring up to the church for you to see. We bought in. We are huge fans. And every Saturday for the last three years in the fall, we're watching Oklahoma football. That's just what we do. We became big fans. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you have a favorite sports team. Maybe you're a fan of one of our professional teams. Maybe you're a Cowboys fan or a Mavs fan. That was exciting the other night, right? Or maybe you like the Stars or the Rangers. Or maybe you have your favorite college team. But I bet probably you're even a bigger fan when they're winning. Is that right? That's kind of what fan clubs and fan groups are like. You start noticing a lot more of those shirts or a lot more of those people who are cheering, the better that that team is playing. I get it. That's why we're Oklahoma Sooner fans. They have a great football team, and we watch them all the time. Well made me think a little bit. I try to make y'all think, too, about how this might relate to Jesus. So Jesus had a lot of fans, didn't he? Think of all the people that came to hear him teach when he had to feed the 5,000. Think of the people that followed him when he was healing the sick, when he was healing the blind people, as they followed him and cheered him on into Jerusalem. He had a lot of fans. But here's what he said. I don't think he was looking for fans. I don't think he was just looking for people who were going to cheer him on. He was looking for followers. And there's a difference. A fan is somebody who wears a shirt and cheers for them on Saturday or whatever it might be. But a follower goes the extra mile. He was looking for people who weren't just going to be fans who would listen and watch. He was looking for people who were going to do what he was doing, feeding the sick, or feeding the hungry, healing the sick, helping the poor. We're called to do that. And he told us that. He said, it's not easy, but if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. So we're challenged. We could be a fan and we could wear our cross around our neck or our what would Jesus do bracelet that maybe you have or maybe you even have one of those fish things that's on the back of your car. Those are great. But are you just a fan? Are you truly ready to be a follower? Someone who's going to go that extra mile and those extra steps no matter what's going on. That's our challenge for me. That's a challenge for you. And I hope that we can live up to that. Let us be followers of Jesus and do what he asks us to do. Will you pray with me, please? Father God, you um, love us so much that you call us to be more than just Jesus fans. You call us to be his followers, to help to change the world. Lead us in that direction in all that we do and say. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Bye-bye. See you next week. Boomer Sooner.
My friends, what a blessing it is to share these holy, sacred moments of worship with you. I'm so blessed by the, these moments that we have together. Even though it's online, even though we can't be in person, to share these moments of worship special to me, and I hope it is special to you. You know, I've heard from several of you over this past week struggling with life in the world that we witness around us, struggling with fears, struggling with having family members who live in California who are struggling with the wildfires approaching. And some of you have friends, relatives that have been evacuated in those wildfires, and you are afraid. Some of you have reached out to me and shared that you have friends who are in the path of the hurricanes that are approaching our coast and devastating Louisiana and part of Texas, and you're afraid, afraid of what you see. Some of you have reached out to me and said, I am afraid of the divisions that we see in our country. Some of you have shared, I'm afraid for my kids to return to school. What are you afraid of? Now, some of you right now, if I ask, what are you afraid of? You may be answering, I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of sharks. I mean, Shark Week was just a a couple weeks ago. I'm afraid of sharks. I'm going to share with you. I have a little teensy fear of heights. Okay? If you go back and you you look at the bulletin cover or the very intro part of this worship service video, you're going to see that that shot of looking down over a cliff at the water beneath you. And that makes me nervous. I remember when I was a boy, I climbed up in this tree. And and my parents, everybody around said, don't climb too far. And I just kept climbing because this was a really big tree, right? And I was was a kid. That's what we do. I'm going to climb the tree. And I climbed all the way up in the top of this tree. And you know what I did after that? After I bragged about how I climbed the tree and I yelled that I'm the king of the tree, you know, I looked down and I became terrified. So terrified, I couldn't climb down out of that tree. Someone had to climb up in the tree and wrestle me and bring me down because I was terrified. What are you afraid of? What is that fear? What are those fears that you struggle with in your life? I want us this morning to join the conversation that we've been having over the last several weeks as we've been following in the footsteps of Jesus and his disciples. I mean, Jesus has performed these wonderful miracles. He has taken five loaves of bread and two fish and multiplied them. He has brought people back from the dead. He has healed those who are blind or lame. He has walked upon the water. He has calmed the storm. And here we continue this conversation with Jesus and his disciples, but it takes a turn. And fear comes into the conversation. So let us turn to our lectionary scripture in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me, must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one, or the Son of Man, is about to come with the majesty of his Father, with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming in his kingdom. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How quickly 
this conversation between Jesus and his disciples turns. I mean, it seems like just last week that Jesus was taking Peter and telling him, upon this rock, I will build my church. And it seems like it's just last week that Jesus gives, metaphorically, Peter the keys of the kingdom. And now with this new authority that Peter had, one of the first things that he does is he rebukes Jesus. He corrects Jesus. I mean, let's think about that for a minute. Would you or I do it really any differently? I mean, let's put ourselves in Peter's sandals for a moment. I mean, here Jesus, this amazing, miraculous man who was walking upon water, who was calming the storm, who was healing people and feeding thousands with crumbs. This Jesus, this Messiah, this person who Peter just said just recently that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, this Jesus, Peter couldn't even begin to imagine would say to him, I've got to go to Jerusalem. We're going to Jerusalem. And when we get there, I'm going to be harmed. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be tortured. And I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to die. I'm going to be executed. And that was too much for Peter to to embrace. Peter was scared. He was afraid. Afraid of what would happen in his life. Afraid that they had everything going on and going in their favor right now. What would life be like without Jesus? And Peter stepped in. I really think in many ways Peter was trying to protect Jesus from himself. You see, Peter had this understanding, this Jewish understanding that the Messiah, which means anointed in Hebrew, this Messiah was going to come, overthrow the Roman government, and be a physical kingdom on this earth forever. Peter hadn't quite gathered, understood yet, that this kingdom that Jesus is talking about, the keys of this kingdom that Jesus was giving him, was spiritual and was unfolding in a physical way in our world, even unfolds right now. And I believe Peter was trying to protect Jesus from himself. And he says, no, Jesus, no, you're, you're, maybe you're speaking wrong. No, and Jesus rebukes him. And in such harsh terms, says, get behind me, Satan. Satan! Now, we're not talking about the impish red being with a bifurcated tail and horns and a pitchfork. But Satan in the Hebrew means, the Hebrew word for the Greek word means adversary. Satan was seen more of of like this prosecuting attorney that would bring your case before God and argue why you should receive punishment and be condemned. This Satan. And Jesus told Peter, get behind me, you Satan, you adversary, you stumbling block, he says. But what Jesus was saying is, get behind me, fall in line, walk in my footsteps, come with me. Don't be afraid. You see, that fear that Peter had began to well up. And he couldn't even imagine what life was going to be like in the future with this crazy talk that Jesus was talking about. Going to Jerusalem, suffering and dying. I mean, how could that even be possible with this amazing, miraculous God in flesh? Where would Peter be left? Have you ever had those kind of fears in your life? Fears of what would happen tomorrow? Fears of where you would be? Fears of if your life changed, what would happen to you? Kind of in a way, what Peter was saying is, Jesus, come on, you got this. You're the miracle man. I mean, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that saying? God won't give you more than you can handle. I've heard that so many times, and that is what I believe one of the most abused, twisted uh, recountings of Scripture that, that I've heard. I've heard it told to people in hospital beds suffering from cancer, who are crying through their pain, and a pastor comes to see them and says, well, God won't give you more than you can handle. I've heard it said of people who have lost their job and they're facing bankruptcy and financial ruin and a loved one says, well, God won't give you more than you can handle. 
I've seen it when people feel overwhelmed by the world around them, where they feel the darkness slowly creeping in, and loved ones, friends, meaning well, says God won't give you more than you can handle. And it makes me question, what kind of God is this? Do you ever wonder where that scripture came from? That actual scripture is really not in our Bibles. Where it comes from is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, when Paul, writing the church in Corinth, says, No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people. But God is faithful. God won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Now, that Greek understanding of temptation doesn't mean cancer, doesn't mean sickness, doesn't mean hurricanes, doesn't mean raging wildfires. It means fit, practical tests to learn a person's character, to uncover a person's character. Remember, Paul is writing to a community of believers, not one person. Paul didn't say, you can survive this. He said, all of you together can survive this. You guys, as a church, as a Corinthian, Christ-loving and Jesus-following community can survive this. You can do it together. So when I hear someone say that, well, God won't give you more than you can handle, What that tells us is oftentimes we put the evil that's going on in the world on God and say that God created it or God caused it. And God didn't. God is right there with you. There's one thing that Peter didn't get in that conversation. When Jesus says, the kingdom is coming, I am coming, is that resurrection happened. Resurrection happened. The stone rolled away. Jesus walked out of the tomb. Resurrection happened. And many of them saw it. They embraced it. And even one of them touched Jesus. And it was real. And it changed their lives. It changed their faith. It changed the world. My friends, the Holy Spirit is right here among us. The Holy Spirit is right here with us. We're not alone. And the, the truth of the gospel is that, yes, we can't handle this by ourselves. There is so much going on in the world right now. It is so messed up in so many ways. There's so much fear that circles around us. And you're right. We can't handle this by ourselves. You can't handle this. I can't handle this. But we can handle this together. We can. Because the Holy Spirit is right here with us, uniting us. Even through these virtual moments of worship, the Holy Spirit is comforting us. The Holy Spirit is leading us. The Holy Spirit is reaching out to us. The Holy Spirit is inviting us. The Holy Spirit is transforming us. So as a faith community, we got this. We got this. Something that Peter finally embraced. Something that the rest of these disciples finally embraced something that we embrace in this moment. There's a lot in this world to be afraid of. But my friends, that fear doesn't paralyze us because we are stronger together and we are stronger with the Holy Spirit among us. So my friends, let us take heart. Let us rise up. Let us bear one another's burdens. Let us, let us carry one another if they need to be carried. Let us feed one another if they are hungry. Let us join in as a family of faith and support one another. Because that, with God leading us forward, is what changes the world. And it's what transforms our community. It's what we call the church. We've got this together. And the people of God said, amen. Please join us in the hymn of response, What I Have Answered When You Called.
We come now to that time of our worship service when we pause and we offer our gifts back to God. It is through your gifts and your resources that we are able to continue the ministry here in our East Dallas community. There are three ways that you can give. You can give online, you can text to give, or you can mail in your offering. Thank you for being a church who values families, who values service, who values mission, so that we can continue to share the love of God to the people around us. Jesus. 
Please join us in our closing hymn, Take Up Thy Cross. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Sisters and brothers, it has been a blessing worshiping with you this day. I hope you have been blessed by our time together. And I invite you to share this service with your friends. Maybe create a watch party right there on Facebook and invite others during the week to come and watch it as well. But let us practice and do what all that God calls us to do in being a church. So my friends, God sends us to serve. Here we are. We are ready to serve. God sends us into the world to love. Here we are. We are ready to love. God sends us to bless the world. Together, here we are, ready to bless the world. Ready to be the hands, the feet, the voice in the heart of Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you.